so yeah um so welcome to the uh una virtual book tour and so happy to have michelle gallon here today um so i guess we'll start out i'm alice lyons this is my book una lily book press um and this is michelle gallon john murray original author of the girl small town um which can you hold up big girl small town so we can okay. duke it's also a cover that features lots of red <laughs> two books here yeah so so happy michelle that you're here and just how's it going during this lock-in phase yeah i think we're on um i think my family are on something like day 27 day 28 it's almost four weeks since we um took our kids out of school we took them out a bit earlier i mean once we heard that the virus had transmitted in the community we just made a, a family decision to to lock down ourselves mm -hmm. and i think the first week was quite tough i mean the kids were really happy they were like no school awesome mom is a very easygoing teacher because i you know i was like yeah whatever are you adding sweeties and subtracting sweeties that's brilliant mm -hmm. um i think we it wasn't too difficult in one sense for our family because I write from home, my husband works from home anyway, um, but clearly having the kids at home for most of the day is a new thing. And there were a lot of things around changing how we shop, changing how we communicate with people. And mm. you know, the little things that you take for granted, like I'm gonna go to a bookshop and have a coffee and buy a book, mm. not there. No, so no. it's quite, in one way it's so the same and in another way it's, it's transformed. Yeah. 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 Same here. I mean, um, I'm on my own at the moment, so I, I can't believe how many hours I'm spending on social media communicating yeah. with people. Um, I, I started to use screen time and then I just gave up because it was just so frightening how, how much time I'm spending on WhatsApp with people. But I need to, you know, I just need to. Um, I think, you know, a lot of people are saying they're really envious of artists and writers because we know how to spend time on our own and so on and i i'm not getting any writing done i'm not getting many creative things done i'm just kind of um i think the first week was just trying to get my head around what was happening so yeah. much energy was put into just emotionally trying to catch up with um with myself and and just coping you know um it's getting a little bit easier um i started digging a garden in the backyard um like a zillion other people and sourdough and all that kind of stuff um these are, so, these are healthy things right these are things that are making us feel like we've a tiny bit of control in yeah. a world where we have much less control than we used to yeah um I, i'm finding it actually quite hard to read i'm getting some writing done but i'm finding reading really i feel like i don't have the energy for it and um, mm -hmm. when i come to something in, like i really do deep dive into it i feel really emotional when i'm reading but um i'm not inhaling books the way i, I was before yeah. the lockdown i was like i'm gonna read so much and i have a huge pile of reading but no i had um i three books on the go one of which is my copy of una mm -hmm. um which i'm working through slowly um and I worked my way slowly through um, The Discomfort of Evening, mm. which is Man Booker nominated, which was amazing. I, What's the author I of that? Don't know that. Oh, show. sorry. It's a translation. She's Dutch. So oh, yeah. Marika yeah. something. Yes. Yeah. 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 I mean, you know, I'm, I'm terrible with, you know, it, it, mm -hmm. I think it took me a year to learn how to say my husband's name. So I'm, I'm terrible mm -hmm. with any names that aren't, you know, yeah, Patty or really. Yeah, but but it's an astonishing read, and I'm also reading Fire Starters by Jan Carson. Mm -hmm. So I've had a sort of uh, three books on the go that I've been working through. And Una was always my um, it's always been my morning time book. Mm -hmm. I, I tend to wake up and I, and I read it. And one of the things I'm I'm actually really interested in is sometimes I have books and. I just really enjoy them. It's like sitting down with a really good Netflix series, right? Where you just sit down, you watch it, you might even have a glass of wine, it's all awesome. Um, and then there are other books where when I'm reading them, I can feel that something's being knitted in my own head as I read. 
Um, and I, I know I had that with Milkman and um, I, I, I have this with Una as well, that when I'm reading it, I have to go, well, that was a page, but now I'm going to have to stop <laughs> and process not just what you've written, but also actually, you know, my own emotional response to what you've written mm -hmm. or the things that you've triggered in in the in the book itself so um that's great to hear. i feel maybe that, that's why i'm jumping ahead but but reading and words are very important to me in lockdown mm -hmm. um so as yeah. our screen i feel um i feel the same way like i was thinking oh yeah get lots of reading done i bought a whole load of books at books upstairs whoops um before i um went into lockdown but I've only been able to manage one book, um, and it's been Tim Robinson's Stones of Aaron, which oh, wow. is really strange just considering that he died um, a few yeah. days ago. Yeah. Um, but I think part of it is because it's so dense and I can manage a page at a time and that's about it. Um, yeah. And then I kind of, just as you're saying, I need to digest it. And I think it's also because Stones of Aaron was really him like walking around the perimeter of Aaron Moore, like micro inches, micro micrometers at a time. And that's kind of the way that I've got to proceed mentally. Like I just can't move very quickly. Yeah. It's, yeah, got an amazing book and just very sad about his passing, but what, just also like, what an amazing life, just yeah. what an amazing life, so. So um, one of the things you've done in Una is um, you've divided the book up into 99 mm -hmm. different parts. <laughs> um, clearly yeah. it's not 100, that would be too close to O, wouldn't it? But um, I find that, again it's kind of when i read one of the sections and sometimes i don't ever sometimes I, I i fire through a few in a sitting but sometimes i read one um what was the line that, that killed me one morning it was she held me in her yes heart mm -hmm. um there are all these lines that just sort of zing in and um i, I was wondering why were you right what what was the 99 sections about is this something that was there from the start is it something that came in the editing process yeah it's funny i i think that i um because i i've mostly written poetry forms are really important to me i can only kind of exist and proceed with forms and um as this book started to progress it it was definitely in episodes um and at a certain point, I was kind of, you know, I think when you're writing, you get a, a sense of how long it's going to be. You know, maybe the, the you can start, start to see the horizon of whatever it is you're working on. And when I was seeing that horizon, I was within, I think maybe I was around 60 something episodes. And I thought, well, 100 is something to aim for. You know, that seems... Um, doable or digestible or something. And um, it, it's something like whenever I get a commission to write something like, you know, 3000 words, my challenge is to make it exactly 3000 words. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. A strange, a strange thing. So, and then it just worked out that I think, I think there's 99, yeah, there's 99 um, chapters in the book. And then there's one, the one chapter that does contain the letter O is unnumbered. So there's actually 100, but uh -huh. there's only 99 um, that are numbered. Mm -hmm. So um, I think, and I mean, I, I mean, I suppose the thing that's drawn a load of attention is the fact that, that the book on the whole doesn't feature the letter zero, which is uh, somebody's, was it, I'm not sure who described it as an act of literary bondage. <laughs> um, <laughs> which, I, which I thought was fascinating because I'm someone who's really interested in the idea of, of creativity sometimes actually being um, stimulated by having um, by having strictures you know mm -hmm. the, the smaller the smaller the box actually the more you might yeah. the harder you have to work to make something incredible so like uh, how did this how did how did you sit down and say hey I'm going to write a book without no anywhere yeah. well or a few but yeah it, it, it's great I, I love i didn't hear that an act of literary bondage but it reminds me of um something that paul muldoon has said about his own 
um, either working with rhyme schemes or any of the elaborate kind of systems he uses in his poetry, he talks about it being like Houdini and it being an escape artist, you know, kind of bond, creating this stricture and then the art is trying to escape from it, you know? Right. And I think that's exactly right. And that's exactly what happened with me with this. Um, I started to write the book because I wanted to write about, I wanted to write about the experience of not being in touch with oneself at some very, very deep level. Um, and it was certainly an experience that I knew from myself. Um, and I wanted to, to me, it felt like something that um, I hadn't rat, read enough about, or um, if it has been written about, I haven't come across the books yet. And so I wanted to write that book where I'd recognize, um, I'd recognize myself, because I think for me, that's what reading is so much about, is about recognition um, and, and connection, you know? So that's how I started the book. Um, and then as I was writing, um, and it became a fictionalized story and the main character, her name was Una, um, I, it, it was just one of those weird ideas that just comes across your mind where I just thought, well, what if I just like took half of her away because that's really what I'm trying to write about is somebody who's kind of gone. Um, and so then I, then it was just a little game, like, okay, well, let me try and write a few sentences without O. Oh. And then it just became fun. And I think it was just like that Muldoon thing of like the, the joy of trying to escape from the, the bondage. Um, and then it became fun. And for me, when it's fun, it's good. I mean, fun, like, I, I'm sure, like, you know, writing isn't always fun, but, um, but there was enough pleasure in it for me every day that I wanted to keep coming, coming back again and again to it. And that's how yeah, it I guess it's like, uh, it's a intellectual puzzle as much as anything else. So mm -hmm. you have a very, you're exploring a, a really emotional subject, but you've got this incredible discipline that's almost keeping you on a tightrope. So you're not going to veer off. It's kind of a safe way to explore such terrifying or, or triggering emotions i imagine mm -hmm. yeah, yeah totally yeah yeah what so maybe it, yeah maybe it's it brings you maybe if you want to say use the metaphor of diving deep it keeps bringing you back to the surface uh, to the yeah. language itself like okay uh i'm down here in this kind of very emotional territory but i'll come up and see what word i can find that means room that doesn't have two o's in it. yeah <laughs> what is it room love mother the mm -hmm. the words that are hard to replace i yeah. was quite interested though because my, my book features you know a missing father and the huge impact that has on the protagonist magella and she she still has her mother and i, I think to be brutally honest if magella had her choice she'd probably swap the mother and the father out mm -hmm. um but in una the protagonist does still have her father but he's absent no yeah he, he he's a he's a void in and of himself yeah completely i mean he's he's mentioned very little in the book but what what little mention of him there is he's he's absent he's gone we don't he's really know out. what happens to him but he's checked out in yeah, some he's way. Out. yeah um but he's he's an absent father so in the sense that i don't feel that he has a huge presence in the book in that he's trying to tell the protagonist what to do or trying to mold her life or holding her up to anything except a silence on the mother's death mm -hmm. um and in magella or in big girl small time her old magella's grandmother has just died and she very much does not want to talk about the death she doesn't really want to go into that she doesn't want to talk about where her father might be or mm -hmm. whether he's living or dead or what happened magella would quite like to close these conversations down mm -hmm. um but in your book, the damage is done by not having those discussions around what's missing by, you know, I mean, I mean, one of the things about the book that was so attractive to me is the um, idea of writing something without an O, oh, the technical achievement in that, and it drew me in, but the absence is what 
what's left is very beautiful and is an incredible technical achievement, but there's a huge absence throughout it. And that is uh, a point of interest, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. um, it demands to be talked about. It demands to be um, focused on. Mm -hmm. um, um, yeah. So I was wondering about the theme of grief and processing grief and how I, I mean in Ireland it's very much as in my novel there's a very much focus on the wake and mm -hmm. you know the funeral itself and then the grave mm -hmm. um, and, and Magella doesn't have that for her father because he disappeared she mm -hmm. doesn't know where he is at what's going yeah. on but with Una I feel like there was a, a, a social sort of a, a death that was very neat and tidy it met with social norms or it, it, it a certain kind of level of manners and then there would have been a funeral and then there would have been a there, then there's a silence mm -hmm. and that's it's just yeah it's just such a void how mm. how did you how did you cope with that as a writer mm. yeah well I think um I think what I was trying to do was to record what um what death is like or was like in um, certain suburbs in post-war America, where death was seen as a kind of failure. Um, and, and I think part of the reason why I moved away from that kind of society um, was, and, and towards Ireland, is because as people are talking a lot about right now, um, the Irish culture really does death a good service, you know? And it's really interesting to me what's going on right now because I'm seeing so many people who are having to, to go without the rituals of death because of, of COVID-19. And it's making me think so much about what I was trying to write about in Una, of what happens to people when, when they're denied, when death is denied, um, which isn't really the case happening here, but certainly the rituals of death are denied people and the pain in that. Um, and I think, I think we come to see how much those rituals really mean, how much meaning they give to, um, to, to processing these things. There, uh, in a sense, I think what's happening right now is showing us the rituals that we need for processing everyday life, like the ritual of sitting down to a meal. I mean, I don't know about you, but like the structure of my day is breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I mean, I'm not drinking or drugging my way through this, through this, do you know, but I'm eating for sure. And it's just somebody that on social, simple somebody on social media, Yeah, somebody on social media said, I don't know about you, but I'm up to seven meals a day. And I was like, yeah, seven <laughs> meals a day sounds about right. It's, yeah. it's kind of like every few hours I need something to yeah. bring me back to this is my body and this is where I am right now. And uh, yeah, my husband stress cooks and stress bakes. So I'm in a very good place <laughs> to have the, those needs met. But I, I think I think it's interesting. I think what's interesting about that is, is, is this idea of ritual and um, I, I really love your protagonist is, you know, this sort of freshly minted American girl um, with all these, you know, on this kind of very old land. I mean, right. She's got that thing where, you know, she's very, she's, she, the narrator is conscious, you know, that she's living on land that was somebody else's not so long ago. Um, but this idea that she's a, a sort of freshly minted American and she doesn't come encumbered with all the traditions and the narratives and the you know the funny languages you've got all these these grandparents kind of locked away in other rooms because they're speaking the the funny original languages mm -hmm. and yet that's what she comes and seeks out I mean that's what she's finding comfort in and definitely that's something I find that we're doing here I'm taking comfort in anything I can do involving uh that's not involving baking but diy you know actually making and doing and mending the sense of control yeah um because you know there's no death is the the big you know we don't have control and yeah. um and with the lockdown i found very much that idea that well if the only thing i can control today is um planting a, a lettuce then yeah. that actually makes me what i do with my day or yeah you know, 
and, and it's also physical, something you can do with your hands. You know, the DIY and the gardening and the bread baking and the things that people are doing. I think that that's, um, that that is a, a massive um, comfort to people that, that they can do something with their hands. And also, also humor. I mean, and I think that's something that in big girls, small town that I love so much and that, that so many people have talked about that they love is just the sense of humor in that book. And, um, and, and that is just, uh, uh, eh, how I'm tripping over myself, but for me, I can't love a piece of literature that doesn't have a real sense of wit and humor in it. You know, yeah. it just, it's not, it's not real. It's not like life is. And, um, and I think there's, there's a lot of humor in your book and, um, and in this COVID situation too. I mean, somebody, I think on Twitter said there's now, there's no AM or PM anymore. There's just coffee time and wine time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I could agree with that. Um, yeah. Coffee to keep me fired up when there's daylight and then when the sky begins to drain a bit and there might be a glass of wine. Totally. Um, although we, we have, I mean, I've got two kids at home here, so I even find the, um, yeah, I, I, there was, a, I mean, both my parents are teachers and there's a lot of teachers in my family and I, I really decided not to go into teaching and this lockdown has completely validated that. <laughs> teaching was never my vocation I'm definitely much happier writing yeah. um, so yeah. there's that I, I'm just thinking though I mean we we met at the novel fair yeah I wanted to chat about year that. Ago, yeah. just over a year ago and yeah. and again this is like this almost before and after like I launched yeah. my book in February when you could still have a book launch right you could still invite 150 people into a bookshop and you know hug and kiss them and drink wine and sign yeah. books those were the days <laughs> and then I, I i remember yeah i'll take my myself and my kids to london and we'll mm. bring them around on the underground well yeah. you know we dragged my kids around and yeah. right up until i think it was two days before yeah two days before we went into lockdown um I was on a radio show in a small studio with maybe five other people. Mm -hmm. um, I did a book signing that evening in our local bookshop, uh, not, not or, or in our local news agent in the town I grew up in. And oh, yeah. then the Monday, everything had changed. But I remember that that was the week Una was having her launch. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I was watching it all happening on social media because this suddenly was my window into the world because I knew I wasn't going to be out doing things anymore. Right. And I was watching you doing your book signings. I was seeing you in bookshops. And yeah, I felt this kind of narrowing of the lens. Yeah. I felt sort of the world shrinking. Yeah, it, yeah, it was. It was like being in a, uh, like a whirlpool going down a funnel, you know? Yeah. And I, the, the, the week of that book launch, it was scheduled for a Thursday. It started out at the top of the funnel, the wide part. And I actually got out on a little tour of bookshops in Dublin and signed and met loads of wonderful bookshop owners. And that was so nice because it was it was physical and material. I could see the books in the shops and I could meet people and sign books and that kind of thing. And it was lovely. And then the day of the launch was the day that we in Ireland closed the schools. So we had to make a, a call and we decided to cancel, um, which was the right decision. But it was it was just so strange. It really, you know, it just went. And um, yeah. But luckily, for a few weeks anyway, after the launch, bookshops were open. And, and I think the thing about publishing a book, unlike a lot of other things like a performance, a theatrical performance, or so many things that have gotten shut down, is we've made things that are, that are physical and are lasting, you know? Sure. And when this is all over, they're going to still be there. They're not, yeah. um, they're not live performances that, without an audience, aren't going to aren't going to be something, you know? So um, I'm grateful sure. for that anyway, but it's still a hard time for everybody in the arts, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But um, to go back to your, your novel fair. Um, so we met, we met at the Irish Writers' Center novel fair in, yeah, it was February in 2019. February 2019, what, 15 yeah. writers, and I don't know how many publishers and agents in a very small room, not I'm, socially distanced. <laughs> I know, like completely unsocially distanced. <laughs> Yeah, we're all crammed together, yeah. if I remember correctly, and we were all very close to each other trying to go, let me tell me about your novel, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, it was, yeah. Yeah, uh, 
quite different. Yeah. And can you tell me what made you participate in the novel fair? Like how, what was the story of your book getting to a publisher and, and oh, my the God. novel fair, how that worked for you? Well, you see, I, I, I started writing Big Girl, Small Town, you know, 13 years ago. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. yeah, no, I'm, I'm one of those, you know, it, it took a long... So basically, I, I, I'd written a short story and it kind of it came out and it had a male protagonist. It was set in a chip shop. There was a disappeared father and it was an abusive mother, alcoholic, mm -hmm. abusive mother. Mm -hmm. um, it, it had the Daily Brothers. It had all the elements of Big Girl, Small Town, um, but it had a male protagonist. And somehow I, I, I wasn't excited about him i mean he was he's a strong character in the short story and the stinging fly picked the short story up and published it that autumn but i had this sense that he had some sort of shadowy um sidekick some woman who was already there who wasn't saying very much and she was kind of fascinating so i was of an age um that i just stopped work for a month that november sat down and wrote seventy thousand words in a month you know so it just poured out it was awesome it took about three years to finish it and then it so took seventy thousand yeah. words in one month november yeah three years after that seventy thousand to finish the rest finish it yeah wow. I, I, in fairness i was a fairly distractible i think i was early 30s at that point um but when i finished it then it took what was it 10 years to find a publisher wow so the novel fair was really quite extraordinary for me because I had I'd been sending it out to agents and publishers and actually really not getting any kind of strong response in in Ireland but when I sent it to people in New York or London I would anytime I sent it out I'd always have somebody engaged with me coming back and talking to me telling what they really really liked about it but there was a question I just kept stumbling on and everybody would say well you know what's wrong with Magella and um and I was like Magella's just, Magella, she's just a bit weird. She's just Magella. But um, in the year before the novel fair, um, a female relative of mine got a very late diagnosis of autism. And I, I was very familiar with the male presentation, but I decided to go off and, and look into the female presentation. And as soon as I started reading it, a lot made sense to me. And I realized that a lot of Magella's behaviors were, would be, you know, a typical female presentation of autism. Definitely, yeah. And this was kind of a really big flash of understanding for me. So I sat down that July, I was working, but my husband took the kids away for three weeks and I rewrote it in July, submitted it to the novel fair because it is the place to fast track track your novel. I, I think in terms in, in terms of Irish and English publishing, you can do yourself no better favor than to try and get shortlisted because or become a finalist. Totally. Because instead of spending, I don't know, years as I did, <laughs> you can sit down in a room, you will meet 15 people who may or may not go for it, but they're going to give you as much feedback as you're as you feel brave enough to take. And it was a complete fast track for me. And I kind of I had a really good feeling when I was shortlisted and I had a really good feeling on the day and it was kind of stressful, but amazing. I mean, I, I'd never spent a day talking about my writing ever in my life. Yeah, not enough. Glorious. Yeah. And how, you, how, how did you find it? Well, and also just to finish up, you got such an amazing, you, have, you got out of it a, a wonderful publisher, an amazing editor in Becky Walsh and, yeah, and a literary agent as well. Yeah. 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 No, I, when I met Becky, I was at, at the novel fair. I thought I want Becky. I just, it, it's just, there was something about the dynamic there. And then I read El, Elna, Elmet, the um, Mambagur shortlisted novel that she'd edited. And I loved how brave she is as an editor. And mm -hmm. um, there's something about like claustrophobic worlds. And I think Una has this as well, these mm -hmm. worlds that are very intensely felt and very intensely brightly painted. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I read Elna, I knew that Becky wasn't scared of these words. She wasn't going to dilute what Magella was and she wasn't going to dilute the world. Yeah. And that, and as a, you know, she, she's been incredibly supportive. She's amazing. Um, and yeah, so the book, the book just seemed after taking so long, Alice, to get out there, it just, seems to have gone really well and and it, it after taking so long to get out there the from the time that you signed with them to the time that the book actually was 
launched and like beautifully designed and marketed and beautifully publicized and it's gotten such an amazing reception i mean it really yeah. has just it just seems like a perfect kind of story of publication yeah, yeah no it, it 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 still feels a little surreal and <laughs> even the fact that i did get to have a book launch and i did get to do the tour i, I got to do the book things that i'd been dreaming of for quite mm -hmm. some time so I, I i do think it's an interesting I mean, I think that you kind of had the first lockdown book launch, the first socially distant <laughs> book launch in Ireland, you know? Um, so you, you've got to do this kind of wide lens to absolute, you know, yeah, yeah. The, the spotlight being very small and being mm -hmm. here. But also, yeah, yeah, yeah. I love the way that people have been um, changing how we use social media and changing how we promote books. And there is like actually this book. This is what we're doing, you know? Right now. Because uh, yeah. I think we'd scheduled ourselves a cheeky cup of tea in Sligo, but we <laughs> have. Doing this instead. Yeah, so um, I love it. Um, it's so nice, because it was great to meet you at the Novel Fair. And yeah, I mean, just in terms of my story with the Novel Fair, um, I, um, you know, with poetry publishing, it's just a totally different story. And when this, this, turned out, to, you know, uh, what I was writing turned out to be a novel. I was really a novice at how to go about publishing it. And as it always seems to be the case with me, it was just kind of like, oh, it just came across my consciousness, this novel fair um, from the Irish Writers' Center. And I just thought, oh, well, that sounds like a really good way to, as you say, just fast track this whole process. Because I'm not great at schmoozing. I'm not it's certainly not my strength, um, you know, a little bit of an introvert. Um, so I just thought, well, let's try it. And so it was so wonderful to be shortlisted. And then, um, yeah, to, to get some training into how to talk about a book. Sure. Um, that was really great. That, that day that we all met before we met, you know, before yeah. the, the speed dating with all the agents and publishers, um, where, we got some coaching that was really helpful to me because i think for me um the idea of doing an elevator pitch on a book was really scary the idea of me um, um fitting in some way into the marketplace was really scary and it was like how am i going to do this in a way that feels authentic um and in a way that just feels like me um because I, I wanted to engage, but I wanted to engage in a way that just felt right. And so the novel fair, I felt space in the novel fair for being able to do that. And it was great. I just felt relaxed. And, um, and it was amazing when I met Anthony Farrell from Lily, but he was the first um, one that I met. Um, and then the story with them was it just went very quickly. Within 24 hours, he came back and said, would I consider holding the manuscript for them? Um, and that was really great. And then there was other interest as well. Um, and I decided to go with Lilliput for a number of reasons. And one of them is, is that they're based here. Um, and I just, it's been such a great experience for me working with them. So it was the right, the right decision um, all, all the way through. And oh. That's amazing. And I, what is it Lilliput say? They only publish the books they think. It's something about how they publish books that they think sh should be there for the next 100 years or the oh, next really? 200 years or something. Yeah, they're, nice. they're not publishing out of any, let's have a commercial. It, we mm. need to have a massive hit, although that's always nice. Yeah. Um, but this is about Lilliput publish what they really and truly believe in. It is not a gigantic machine. It's an yeah. indie press. It's awesome. Yeah, totally. Totally. Yeah. It's, a, it's a passion passion-driven publisher for sure. And mm -hmm. they picked up another author this year at the Novel Fair, Ooh. Estelle Birdie. Um, oh, wow, yeah. Who's gonna publish her novel, uh, it's called Raveling with them, I guess in 2021. So that's yeah. another good Novel Fair story. And hopefully- Yeah, I met Estelle fun. briefly at one, I think the novel, they, they asked me to come back and help with the novel pitch prep mm -hmm. day. Mm -hmm. um, which again, it, like it reminded me very much of us all sitting in a room, kind of going, "What do you mean? What is my novel about?" <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's all that was really great training. Um, so you, you, you wrote. So I, you, you, you moved from poetry into writing books. 
Mm -hmm. So how long did it take you to write, Una? Because I am interested. Yeah, it took me four years. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yep, four years of, you know, kind of short spurts often. And mm -hmm. then I had one year of a fellowship where I could really concentrate, where I didn't have any other job and no teaching, just writing for a, a, a focused nine months, which was really, really important that sounds heavenly it was. as it was I, you know i literally I've, I've done 30 days once and when my husband took my kids to france for three weeks again that's that's constraints right i had three weeks and i did have a nine to five job but i had three weeks where i knew my mornings and my evenings were entirely my own mm. and that i can you know it was the first time in 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 years that I time to myself, you know, you know that bit where you have kids and oh yeah, you move around a lot and everything's so compressed. It was the first point I remember sitting down and I, I would love. I do think that that's a great gift that an artist can get is that gift of confined time, if you know what I mean, constrained yeah. time to be able to say this is your only thing you have to do, but Definitely. it's not going to go on indefinitely. There is mm -hmm. a, a kind of a, a time limit here that. A, definitely yeah. um, so so i want to ask you before we wrap up what what's next what are you doing I, I i have a sense you're well into your second novel yeah so the second i i have a first draft of the second novel and it's oh. called factory girls and it's um set in a very small town again a border town and it's set the summer at the ceasefire in a shirt factory and I worked in a shirt factory one summer. And so there's a lot of personal experience in it in terms of the world and in terms of, you know, how factories run in terms of the sort of the political climate, the, the, the cultural scene, all of that is very, um, is very familiar to me. So I've really enjoyed writing that. And I'm trying at the minute to work my way through the second draft mm -hmm. and oddly on the side, another something else is knitting itself i don't even know what it is but mm -hmm. i sit somehow i find that when i go to do the hard work of a second draft because i find that harder than writing mm -hmm. then this other thing pops its head up and says yeah but you could just write 500 words of me mm -hmm. <laughs> and then you get loads of satisfaction before you go into the editing stuff so it's almost like my mm -hmm. i'm bribing myself by letting myself write this other thing don't know what uh -huh. it is great but it's writing itself while I'm editing Factory Girls. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, I, I, I just, yeah, it feels amazing to have a book out after all this time. Wow. And um, to have one that I'm trying to pull the, do you know when it's corset and you want it to kind of, mm -hmm. yeah, I don't know what that word is, but uh -huh. tighten it up. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then this other thing, knitting itself on the side is really Wonderful. interesting. What about you? What are you, what are you working on? That was a big question that was, uh, you know, I've been wanting to ask since the start. Um, there's something bubbling away as well in me, but it isn't, I'm in no, God, I'm in nowhere near um, ending a first draft. All I know is that there are, it, that it's centered on sisters, that there's a sisterhood um, and it keeps going. I'm not sure where it's set. The, Poland is a very important place to me and there's a story of two sisters in wartime Poland that I've, got, I've kind of started writing, but I'm not, it's still too early to kind of say whether that's gonna stick or whether that will fall away. But it's definitely so, yeah. sisters. sisters. I, I have three sisters and um, my novel features a family of five sisters mm. um, and how you know that works as well uh, again absence being a key thing um but mm. yeah i love the idea of exploring how your siblings um give you a sense of who you are and where you are i mean these big irish families i'm one of six right you know mm -hmm. six kids yeah. um and where you come in the family and the kind of atmosphere in your family at all the different stages is very important mm -hmm. um I, I don't know it, maybe you try reading discomfort of evening because it's there's it's really interesting very atmospheric story of you know a family who loses a sibling very mm -hmm. early on in the book mm -hmm. and how that reverberates mm -hmm. um okay definitely right oh, definitely actually put that on yeah. my list sure for sure mm -hmm. so michelle thank you so much for chatting with me i love chatting with you and um, 
And just to wrap up, maybe I'll say that both our books are available as eBooks right now, which sure. during lock-in is probably mm -hmm. the easiest way for people to get them on Amazon and Kobe and wherever else you can get <laughs> eBooks. Hold up, big girl, small town. Yeah, so, chips. I love that. I love. Do you know who did that drawing? Sarah Marathini is a graphic designer. She's freelance. She's based in London, and she does a lot of stuff for Ashette. So um, she, I, I, got, I finally got to meet her. I got to meet her when I was in London back in the days when you could jump on a plane and go somewhere. Um, so I, I got to meet her, and I was thrilled. I, I think the cover is amazing. Yeah, it's such a great cover. Love it. Love it. Oh, so I love your cover. Oh my, this this cover. You know, I'm a failed art student. This cover makes me want to go and get my 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 art palette, which I never threw out. And get back to it, and and yeah, it's something we didn't explore in the conversation. But that kind of the artist side of it, mm. you know, is, yeah. is fascinating. So, um, yeah, I think actually, Alice, I have been in lockdown too long, and I would just sit here all day talking to another grown up, yeah. a grown up person who hasn't asked me to make a Lego brontosaurus. <laughs> I know it's so, it's actually so nice for me to be talking to a human being and not like being on Twitter. <laughs> yeah, no, I know people who move and they're not speaking in pissy one-liners. Yeah, so um, thank you very thank much you. for having me to your virtual book tour. I have thank loved it. So thank you. Much, Michelle, loved it. Thank you.